What's up? In this video, I will show you how I record my iPhone 15 Pro videos. So by the end of this video, you will be able to record in 4K 60 frames per second in Apple Lock without having to use an external SSD on your iPhone 15 Pro and your Pro Max. You will also have much smaller file size because you don't necessarily need to record in ProRes to get really good quality in Apple Lock. You will also know what gear you should use or not use to be able to make professional or cinematic videos with your iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max. So you can actually save a bit of money there. You will gain full control of all the camera settings of your iPhones and you won't have to look at a flat lock image anymore while recording because there is actually a way to have a display LUT so that you can see how your videos will look later. So I would say let's get into it. So first things first, the app that we're going to use to be able to do all of those things is the Blackmagic camera app and not the native Apple app because there you don't have all these functionalities available. So what I actually did is that I assigned the action button to the Blackmagic camera app. So to do that, you simply go into your settings menu and under action button, you can select shortcut and under shortcut, you can simply create a shortcut that opens the Blackmagic camera app. It's quite easy, self-explanatory, so I don't really have to show that here. And your next step is to set up the Blackmagic camera app correctly. So you go on the settings and there you find everything you need. At first, as you can see, I've selected HEVC H265 under codec because Apple ProRes, Photo 2 HQ, etc., they are all a lot bigger. And HEVC gives you a really good quality while not wasting so much storage space. And HEVC is also the reason why you don't need an external SSD anymore if you want to record in 4K at 60 frames per second because HEVC files are a lot smaller. So the iPhone actually doesn't need to write that much data per second and that's why it can save that internally. You don't need to connect anything anymore. It's pretty cool. In fact, the video footage that you probably saw in my last iPhone 15 Pro video of my two week Thailand trip here only needed about 46 gigabyte of this space. So I wouldn't even need the 256 gigabyte version that I have here to be able to record a full trip without having to transfer files all the time. So definitely select HEVC here. It is still 10 bit files, so no worries. And it looks really good. Then the next setting, of course, 4K. I always want to shoot 4K today because we're living in 2023. And then Apple Lock HDR. That's important here because that has all the benefits. It looks better, gives you more dynamic range, and it doesn't look as over sharpened as the others. So it actually looks a bit more cinematic. Then the others here, time code, etc. I leave that. There is a functionality which is quite interesting, time-lapse recording. I didn't actually shoot a time-lapse yet with that. I've yet to try that out, but I did a quick test and it's really that you can essentially turn that on. And then under capture one frame every, you can assign the timing for whenever it should capture a frame. So let's say I shoot in 24 frames per second and I would assign one second here. Then every 24 second, I create one second of video. You can also go lower here with the frames. It's actually a very good functionality because because it gives you an Apple Lock video as well directly, so you don't have to go through all that time-lapse process, like developing your raw photos, etc. The opposite side, it doesn't give you the full, full raw functionality, like the Moment app, for example, would give you if you shoot single photos for time-lapses, but therefore it's very quick and the footage matches perfectly to the rest of your video. So it's actually great that they included this functionality. And then under camera, enable vertical video, you definitely want to turn that off because vertical video sucks, we're not on TikTok, here. Of course, it's fine if you want to make vertical videos or reels, but I personally am not a big fan of that. Then if you scroll a bit down, shutter measurement, I have that set to speed. For certain applications, angle would make more sense, but I think for most creators today, it's actually better to use speed here because then you see exactly what the camera is doing. Lens correction, I have also turned that on anamorphic decrease. You don't need that only if you use anamorphic lenses in front of the camera. We'll come later to that in the gear section. And the rest one here, I just left it as as it was by standard. Audio, it's the same. If you use external microphones, you could change some settings here, but aside from that, I leave it as it is. And on a monitor, I selected display histogram because the histogram is actually quite important when you shoot log footage to be able to expose it correctly. You don't always need it, but oftentimes it's good to be able to see if you clip your highlights or not. And the media section is only important if you edit your videos in DaVinci Resolve and you automatically want to upload the footage to your projects. In that case, 
I selected here proxies only because I don't want to waste so much data on my plan when I upload the full clips. So I only selected proxies here. Also only do that for certain projects. So it's not actually that important. Then auto upload to selected project. Like later in the media section, I will show you, you can select the project there and then it only uploads the footage to that one project. It's actually quite nice. And let's say you want to synchronize the whole clips and not just the smaller proxy files, you can select enable upload over only over Wi-Fi, because then it's only when you're connected to a Wi-Fi network that it uploads all the files so your data plan doesn't get low. And um, save clips too, you can either select in-app only or in-app and photo libraries. So it's up to you here what you want to have. If you want to have it in your photos app, then select that. And the more important part comes now, this is LUTs. There I turned display LUT on and under LUT selection, I selected Apple Lock to Rec 709 V1 because I find that looks a bit better than the other LUT. What that does is essentially ensuring that you don't look at the flat lock image while recording your video, like the image already looks then as it would look after you color graded or you did your basic conversion. And I find that a lot easier to shoot then because I want to see how it looks later. I'm not really interested in the flat lock image in the first place. Then you also have a functionality called record LUT to clip. This is for example good if you saved your final color grade in DaVinci Resolve as a LUT file. Then you could load that into this app here and activate this functionality and the LUT is like baked in, in into your footage. Like you don't get an Apple lock anymore, then you automatically have the LUT applied and you essentially don't have to do any color grading more in post. It's not important for most scenarios, but if you have a stationary shot like I do have, have here for example right now, then it's actually a great functionality. A great feature there is also, I can quickly show you that under media, if you have some media files here in there, you can also add more media into this app from your photos library and that also gets uploaded automatically then to your project, which is actually quite nice in case you should sometimes get some quick shots with your Apple camera app. Then that's also available, including proxy files in DaVinci Resolve directly. And if you go into the camera part of the app, there are a few more settings that I would recommend you to choose at first in the second right bar here. You can have multiple options. For example, as you can see, I turned my grid lines on there. That's good to have a bit better understanding of your framing so the shots look a bit nicer. And what I also did here, I did this preview of the aspect ratio on in two by one aspect ratio because I export my videos for YouTube in a two by one aspect ratio instead of 16 by nine or so. So by turning that on here, I see automatically which or what is in the frame and what but not. Of course, if you publish your videos in 16 by nine, then that doesn't really matter. But for me, that's actually important. Or if you wanna use cinematic boss later for a 2.35 by one look, you can also swipe down here and turn that on. It gets even lower, 2.39, 2.4. But in my case, I don't need that. So these are the functionalities that I use here. It's a bit more like zebras, for example. You can use that and some stuff that I don't even know because I never used it. You can also quickly turn the LUT on and off here. So this bar is sometimes important. And there are a few more options in this bar. At first, there is the focus where you see an A right now to the side. There, I would usually leave it to auto because the focusing on the iPhone 15 Pro does a really good job. But if you want to set your focus manually, then you can unselect auto there and do that manually as well. It can sometimes make sense, but you can also lock the focus quickly in there by pressing long on the screen. And then you see it appears here, the AEAF lock that locks the focus and also the exposure. But when you use this functionality, you should lock your shutter speed or your overall exposure at first because it will also change your exposure and lock it in. So you would have to set that up first and then lock only the AF, the autofocus by doing that. So essentially I never use manual focus with this app. I just press long on the screen to let the focus stay where it is. And our next option here is the exposure compensation. So there you can essentially tell the app what exposure value it should use. I also don't use it that much, but for example, if you shoot time lapses and you have changing lighting conditions, then it can make sense to set it a bit lower here, for example, to protect your highlights. And our next one here is the stabilization mode. To be honest, I always use standard. In my opinion, that's already enough stabilization. I don't need more, but let's say you would do some sports stuff or so that you can set that here to cinematic or to extreme cause then it stabilizes even more. Or if you set your iPhone on a tripod so that you don't need stabilization at all, you can also turn that off. 
because that actually gives you a little bit wider, wider field of view. It's for example good if you want to film yourself talking and you want to sit a bit closer to the camera. And that's actually it for the kind of permanent settings that you want to set up there. The rest is really about the shooting itself and that is the top bar or all the options that you see there is at first to the left the lens. I'm usually shooting at 24 millimeters because that has, has the best quality. And if you get close to subjects with this lens, you actually get a decent amount of background blur because the lens is quite sharp. That's actually what I saw in the comments of my first iPhone 15 Pro video. Some people were like writing, oh, that's not shot on an iPhone because there's background blur or, no, or so. No, that's not that it's shot on another camera. It's just that you have to get close to things and you really get a bit of background blur with the iPhone. It doesn't really count for the 13 millimeter lens because it's a bit too wide that you don't get much blur. But with the 24 millimeter and the 70 millimeter and I think also the 5X zoom lens on the iPhone 15 Pro Max, there if you get close to things, you will get a bit of blur in the background. It's not the same as your normal camera, but it actually looks quite nice. So let's go to the next point and that is frames per second. I usually have it set to 23.98 because that's what I publish my videos in. It's like the internet 24 frames per second. So I don't keep it to the actual 24, but 23.98. And if I wanna shoot slow motion, I set it to 59.94 because that's a multiplicator of this 23 point, what is it, 98. So I also use that instead of actual 60 frames per second. And now in post later, if I wanna have slow motion, I can set the speed of the clip to 40% because 23.98 is exactly 40% of 59.94, so I get a 40% slow motion there. And now important is the next point also, the shutter speed. So let's say you you record with an ND filter, then if you shoot in 24 frames per second or 23.98, the correct shutter speed here would be one over 48 because that's twice the frame rate. And that means that you get natural looking motion blur. But let's say you wanna record slow motion footage, you have the FPS set to 59.94 or 60 frames per second then you would have to set it to one over 120 because that is then twice the frame rate. And then when you slow it down, you again have natural looking motion blur. Otherwise it could look a bit weird. So record in one over 120 here, but that's the thing now, you don't necessarily always use ND filters on your iPhone because sometimes you just want to quickly get it out of your pocket and get a shot. There is just no other option than raising the shutter speed. So in that case, I sometimes even shoot at like one over 4,000 or one over 8,000 or so. In that case, you just can't change it. it, doesn't give you a natural looking motion blur, but honestly, as long as there's not too much motion in front of your camera, people usually don't see that anyway. In fact, like the first two or three years here on YouTube, I never used ND filters and just ramped up the shutter speed all the time. And the only people that ever complained about that were like some cinematographers or so that are very experienced, but the average user usually doesn't see that. So I would say you are fine most of the time, unless you really move your phone around a lot. And then, the next point here is iris. Iris is essentially aperture on other cameras. Can't change that here, unfortunately. Otherwise, you would probably not need an ND filter anymore, but that's not possible, so we're not changing anything here. Let's come to the next setting, which is the ISO, which starts at 64 on your 24 millimeter lens. It gets a bit lower on the other lenses, and this is generally a safe setting because you don't get much noise there, but it looks to me like it also doesn't give you the full dynamic range of this camera. So for example, if I point the camera now into a more lighty source here, into my light, and I raise the ISO, then when we get towards 800 around, you see that on the histogram on the bottom left side, it moves more towards the right side completely. Like here in the bottom, you see that the histogram already maxes out at about 80%. But now when I scroll that up, then suddenly the histogram starts moving to the right. So you can actually record more detail in the shadows there. And it looks like at around 1600 or 1250, it maxes out. Now, now that gets a bit technical now, but you actually have that with lots of cameras that if you shoot at higher ISOs in log formats that you capture the maximum dynamic range of cameras. For example, my Fujifilm X-H2S also has a base ISO of 1250. So if I would shoot below it, I would essentially get less dynamic range, which doesn't make any sense. But the thing on the iPhone is now that if you shoot at this higher ISO at around 1250, you already get a lot of noise in the shadows. So you will have to use noise reduction in post to still have a good looking image. That's why I would actually say that, especially if you don't have the computer or the software to do proper noise reduction, 
maybe don't do that. Shoot at lower ISOs, only raise the ISO really as much as you have to do in order to shoot low light shots or so, but over in normal daylight conditions, I would not raise that in that case, then you rather get a little bit less dynamic range. Maybe you have darker shadows then or so. But if you already shoot at a higher level, let's say you have a good computer to do noise reduction and software, etc., and you have situations where you need a lot of dynamic range, maybe the sun gets down and you want to capture something in the shade while preserving the sky, for example, then it actually makes sense to shoot at those higher ISO levels to get more dynamic range. Okay, so much about the Blackmagic camera app and all these settings. And by the way, the app is free, which is awesome because this app gives you everything you need, plus some extras such as the cloud synchronization and that without even paying anything. That's pretty cool. Other apps will have it hard from now, I would say. But let's not talk about the gear that I use. And there's the usual question that people ask me, did you use a gimbal? And I have to say, no. Of course, I used a little bit of post stabilization in DaVinci Resolve for certain shots that had a bit of shake, but I did not use a gimbal at all. I, and I only used the standard image stabilization from the Blackmagic camera app, as I showed you before. So honestly, to get smooth looking shots with a phone, you don't need a gimbal. There are certain shots, maybe if you really want to walk around a person or so, or you really want to track a person for a very long time, it can make sense to use a gimbal. But for all of the shots that you see in my videos, you don't need one. But there are a few other tools that I actually used and liked, and also a few tools that I liked but did not use from Freewell and Sandmark. So let's get through them. First tool that I can absolutely recommend if you want to shoot videos with your iPhone, especially your 15 Pro and Pro Max, is that one here, that's the Peak Design Mobile Tripod, I think it's called. I will le link all of those uh, tools in the description below, by the way. And this is great because it attaches via MagSafe to the back of your iPhone, and then it acts like a tripod from there, so you can either place it like that, or you can also turn it around and you have your landscape shots. Cause again, we don't want to use vertical video here, right? And so this is cool to film yourself and also to film time lapses quickly. For example, you see the shot here right now where I'm just driving with my motorbike. I just saw that it looks pretty nice cause the sun was falling there nicely from the side. So I quickly wanted to set up that shot, got up from my motorbike, used this little tripod here to quickly put my phone down, drove through it and I got the shot already. So that's why I think that this little tripod from Peak Design is so powerful because it just makes filming yourself and other shots super easy. And another tool that I actually use quite a lot together with the iPhone 15 Pro is the Apple Watch. In my case, that's the Ultra 2, but you don't necessarily have to use an Ultra. You can use those lower tier Apple Watches as well. I just use the Ultra 2 now because I had an Apple Watch, I think generation six before and it got scratched and broke like pretty quickly actually because it's not as rugged while the Apple Watch is titanium obviously and the glass is inside the titanium frame. So if I knock it somewhere, what happens weekly? I, I, so far at least, I did not get any scratches at all and that's great. Anyway, let's come to the reason why I use the Apple Watch with the iPhone 15 Pro and that is simply that on the Apple Watch, I can select the camera remote app so that automatically opens the camera app on my phone and I can actually see what the camera sees. That's perfect if I wanna get shots of myself because I don't wanna use the front camera to film myself because the quality of that camera is much lower than the back cameras. So here in that case, I would just use the 24 to 13 millimeter lens usually, use that Peak Design tripod to quickly set up the phone somewhere and then I can check the framing and where I am in the frame on my Apple Watch and I can even press record here so I don't have to waste any space. Now, the downside of this method is that it doesn't work with the Blackmagic camera app. I hope that Blackmagic comes out with an Apple Watch app soon, but so far it seems like there are no plans for that. So you can either directly record in the native Apple camera app and record in ProRes, then have a bit larger file sizes, which if you don't do it too often, is not really an issue. Or what I also did sometimes is that I use the Apple camera app then together with the Apple Watch to check my 
my framing and then I got back to my phone, switched to the Black Magic camera app, went out again and got my shot then. It's not ideal, but it saves a bit of storage space and I have more control over my shutter speed, etc. And as mentioned, there's also some other gear that I use with the iPhone 15 Pro, some of what I used a lot and some not. So let's start with what I use a lot and actually most of the time that's the Sendmark variable ND filter. Now, the reason why I use that a lot is that it has this clip on mechanism here. Like you can either use that with one of those Sendmark cases so that you can attach that directly to the case or you can attach this filter to this clip here and then you can use it with any case you want and just clip it in front of your camera. And I found that super useful because I usually have my iPhone in my pocket just like normal and I don't want to have any lenses or filters attached by while doing so because obviously it's too big then and a bit too heavy while I'm walking around. And here that's super neat because I usually just plug, uh, clip that somewhere on my shirt or on a pullover or so like in, inside the uh, front pockets. And then I just had to take that out all the time, put it in front, adjust my shutter speed and I was able to film, which is, I would say, the quickest solution ever. So that's why the Sandmark Variable ND Filter was actually a tool that I pretty much used all the time and I can recommend it. I didn't test this filter scientifically, but I had the impression that it makes the colors a little bit warmer. But I must say I actually liked that, like it gave it a pleasing touch to the images, warmer colors look quite nice. So I'm very satisfied with this filter and I can absolutely recommend it. So, so much about the VND filter, let's also have a look at other accessoires that you can get. There's at first this rig here that is also from Sandmark. And now I must clearly say I did not use that even once. The reason is not that it's bad or so, but simply as I mentioned before, I'm a run and gun shooter and I want to shoot quickly, I have my phone in my pocket, I want to take it out and quickly get some shots and now these rigs they are great if you know that you shoot for an extended period of time in a certain location and you don't want to put your phone in your pocket because those rigs essentially allow you to put all sorts of gear on it like you can use cold shoe mounts or like your usual tripod screw screws the quarter inch ones to attach all sorts of gear that you would usually attach to your normal camera or so and then plug that into your phone could also like attach SSDs, etc. on it. So for like stationary shooting, in case you don't want to buy a proper camera, or you don't have the money to do so or so, then that's actually a good solution to attach all the gear like external microphones or so to your phone. But as mentioned before, I did not use that thing at all. And aside from that, Sandmark also makes all sorts of lenses and other filters, which I didn't test yet. But if you want to order maybe the rig or the VND filter or so from their shop, then you will find that there. What I find quite nice from Sandmark is that they also have leather bands for your Apple Watch and leather cases for the iPhones. I'm a big fan of leather. I think it just looks nice together with that silver color here and it's actual leather and not some fake leather so it also lasts quite long. And talking about lenses, there is also the Sherpa set from Freewell here which includes quite a lot actually, also that case here. Now the way how the system works is that you need this phone case here from Freewell and then you can attach all those lenses and filters to the front of that phone case and that was also the reason why I didn't use it much because again I'm a run and gun shooter and I'm also a big fan of slim cases like when I have my phone in my pocket I essentially don't want to feel a case at all I would actually like to use the phone completely without a case I just don't do it for obvious reasons so essentially I would always have to change the case and then plug the lens on etc to shoot that's why I didn't end up using it much but again if you more a stationary shooter or maybe you want to replace your normal camera completely with your iPhone 15 Pro which you can do it is certainly good enough then this is actually a set that I can recommend a lot and now I would say let's start with the lenses here and the first lens that I wanted to show you is this one here the 18 millimeter wide angle and to show you why this lens is great, I would say let's go outside and show you a quick vlog on this lens. So now I'm shooting on the 18mm lens here, I only use it together with the case and decided not to use the Sherpa system because I tried it before and when I use it with the grip and also an external microphone, it doesn't really feel solid because the moment I stop vlogging, I cannot put it anywhere without unscrewing everything. Like my normal camera, usually I would either use the capture clip from Peak Design to like quickly put it onto my belt or I would have a camera strap 
strap so I could just let, leave it hanging around, even with the microphone attached. But with an iPhone, you won't do that because things will probably fall apart. And that's why I just go minimalistic here. Use the internal microphone from the iPhone 15 Pro together with the 80 millimeter lens and also an ND64 ND filter. So everything should look pretty nice. And regarding the lens, I must say, I, I think it's pretty good actually because we get background blur now. Can you use the one X lens from the iPhone. So the quality is actually really good. I would say no one would actually guess that that's shot on a phone simply because how it looks, it looks more like an APS-C camera, I would actually say. Okay, so much about the 18 millimeter lens. Let's come to the next one here, which is the long range macro lens. Now the thing with this macro lens is that you already have a macro lens in your iPhone. However, the look of both lenses is very different. I find that the freeware lens looks a lot more dreamy, the corners look a lot different, and also the distance is a little bit farther away on the freeware lens, which in that case is actually good for product photography, for example, because sometimes you don't want to get too close so that you still see the product a bit, but you also reveal the detail and you can do that with this lens if you do a lot of product photography or product b-roll or whatever and again you attach this lens here to the 24 millimeter camera on your phone which has the best quality so the overall quality that you capture with this lens is also better same as you would do with the 18 millimeter lens and there's actually no lens inside here because i also got this nice big case here from freewheel just pretty nice if you go for one lens setup because as you can see there is at first the lens and then also all the ND filters from Freeware that fit on the lens in there. So it's great to have that. And as you can see, this lens is the Cinemorphic lens from Freeware, the 1.33x version. So this lens gives you the anamorphic effect that many people like that you oftentimes see in cinema movies. It essentially squeezes the image together in the width and then you have to de-squeeze it again when you edit your video. You get those black bars at the top and bottom. And it also gives you those special anamorphic lens flares that many people like. And if you do use this lens, it's actually also good to use the Black Magic Camera app because as you saw before in the settings, there's also the de-squeeze option for anamorphic lenses. So when you use this lens with the Black Magic Camera app, you can already see directly how it will look later because otherwise you would see the squeezed version and that doesn't necessarily give you a good idea of the framing, etc. So great lens if you want to have the anamorphic effect. Aside from that, I really like that it comes with all those ND filters here. Very able ND filter would be a better but still good they also have a snow mist filter here for that dreamy dreamy look and also a circular polarizer so basically all filters that you really need but again for run and gun shooting that's not really for me so i probably only will use it if i want to get some special shots with my phone while I'm at home, but I don't really bring it on trips. Oh, and there's one more thing that I forgot. Freewell also has this grip here, which connects to your phone via Bluetooth. Then you have a remote shutter here essentially, so you don't have to press your screen all the time to start and stop recording. And this grip is actually pretty cool because it comes with an Arca Swiss plate here at the bottom, so you can quickly mount that to your tripods. And it also has a selfie stick included. Just have to look again how that works, yep. <laughs> can just unfold that and then you essentially have your selfie stick to like film around or film yourself a bit better or something like that. So it's actually a very handy tool and it also comes with a cold shoe mount at the top and some quarter inch screws so you can attach a microphone or all sorts of other tools that you want to use together with your phone. So this grip is actually something that I bring on my trips because this is very easy and quick to attach and it gets all the features. You can also quickly place your iPhone with that on a surface and shoot a time lapse or so. So it can also be an alternative to the Peak Design mobile tripod. It's just not as versatile because obviously you can't change the angle then. But yeah, this grip is awesome and it might also be an alternative to something like a big rig like that. Really depends on the use case, whatever you want to do with your iPhone. Okay, that's all the gear that I tried so far for the iPhone 15 Pro. I must say what's still missing there is for me a lens that just gives you a bit more blur, like something like a 50 millimeter, maybe even a 50 millimeter 2.8 full frame equivalent lens or so. 
And I saw that there are already similar options, like um, one company, I will try out a 60 millimeter lens soon where I have to see if that would be a solution or not. I think Sandmark also has a 50 millimeter lens, but I think Freewell on the Sherpa system, for example, while the system overall is great, such a lens is really missing. So Freewell, please come up with such a lens in the future. That could eventually mean that I would start using the Sherpa system more on my trips because Obviously, if I can get that look and more shallow depth of field in my videos with the iPhone 15 Pro, could mean that I will use that phone a little bit more than my actual cameras. And aside from that, I actually shoot a lot with the iPhone 15 Pro right now, so there will be even more tutorials in the future. I think the next one will be about color grading and editing the videos from the iPhone 15 Pro. So if you're interested in that, hit the subscribe button now, and I hope to see you in my upcoming videos. Bye.